Okay, before we start, uh, is there any questions from last class about anything? Okay, one thing uh, a student uh, reminded me uh, to talk about, and I'll just advertise this quickly. I do have, uh, this is just a personal advertisement. I do have some uh, research assistant uh, positions that probably are going to come into effect like by the end of the month or something like that. So if anyone's in, they're paid uh, and the details we haven't worked out, like the numbers of hours per week and things like that. Uh, but if some of you are interested, I encourage you uh, to just submit an application, which you can do uh, from my website, just put a CV up. And they're related to like blockchain and auditing. Uh, if you don't have any specific experience in that, some experience in Java would be useful because a lot of uh, smart contracts are coded in a object-oriented language called Solidity that's similar uh, to Java. And if you have any experience in, in looking at blockchain or smart contracts, that, that would be great as well. Um, so I'll just, I'll float that uh, as an option. Uh, the details aren't like firmed up yet. Uh, so at this stage, I'm just collecting uh, applications. Um, and yeah, yeah, so uh, feel free to, to apply uh, for that as well. Okay, uh, last round for questions about this or about anything from last week, about the assignments, exams, anything like that, about evaluation frameworks, no? Okay. Okay, uh, let me look into that. I will uh, make a note of it in the course website. So let me just see quickly if I can. Yeah, so I, uh, I think I just have the permission set wrong. So I can, I'll try and fix it during the break. And uh, if, if not, I'll, I'll uh, definitely have it fixed by tomorrow. Let me just make a note and then I'll, uh, I'll, ask the, or I'll answer your next question. Yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, all the assignments will be individual. Uh, so no group assignments. The project you can work on as a group, but uh, all the assignments will be individual. Other questions? So assignment one I should have ready by next week uh, and on the website so you can look at it and start working on it. And it will either involve stride or evaluation framework, I haven't decided, uh, but it will, uh, it will be something that you will have seen by the end of this lecture so you can get started on it. Okay. Okay, so for this class, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about evaluation frameworks. We'll actually do one, uh, and then I'll also show you uh, what it looks like in an academic paper. Um, so we'll talk about evaluation frameworks. Okay, and uh, just to remind ourselves, this is a very general methodology. It's by general, I mean it's not specific to software or hardware or uh, people or whatever. Like you can use it. Anytime you basically have a bunch of alternatives, uh, then you can uh, compare them using this type of framework. You might change the way it looks from a perspective of columns, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but, but there's nothing that really limits it to a specific application uh, domain. Okay, and the output is something that you, it's so familiar to you that it doesn't even look special. Uh, but you'll see it's, it's a little tricky uh, actually doing the details of it. Uh, but the chart is basically a, you know, a simple chart. Uh, it will kind of have rows and columns so rows would be like uh, different alternatives. So we talked about passwords. So like instead of doing a password, you might use a password manager, you might have biometrics or whatever. And these are truly alternatives. It's not like you're going to do, well, you could do biometrics and a password, but that, that would be like, that would be considered an alternative uh, in and of itself. Uh, but generally you're not going to compare things that are complementary. Like you wouldn't compare, I don't know, using encrypted HTTPS and using a VPN and using Tor for anonymous web browsing because they all do kind of slightly different things. They're all about like kind of a secure network connection, but it's not like, there's no reason why you can't just use all of them, right? Depending on what you want to do. 
Uh, whereas if you're doing two-factor, you're not doing biometrics. If you're doing biometrics, you're not using a password manager. Uh, so they're like truly alternatives. Okay, so you would uh, generally have as your rows, you know, your alternatives. Uh, another thing that, that just goes to some of the questions I got last class. Uh, generally, uh, another thing that, that makes them alternatives is, or another, okay, here's a counter example. So you have things that aren't truly alternatives because you could do all of them. Okay, it's not like by doing one, you're sort of excluding uh, doing the other. Uh, the other thing uh, that aren't really truly alternatives is if you have like versions. So like, for example, you want to use TLS version 1.2 and you want to compare that to TLS version 1.1. This kind of evaluation framework might be useful, but those aren't really alternatives. Like TLS 1.2 is going to be better in every sense than TLS 1.1. So it's just a straight upgrade. Uh, so generally you don't use this for upgrades. It's more for comparing like all of these rows should be viable. There's no reason why you wouldn't choose one of these rows. It's going to depend on, on your application, okay? But if you want to talk about like, I don't know, WEP versus WPA1 versus WPA2, it's just like you're going to use WA, WPA2. Like once you have it, there's no reason to not use it essentially. Um, and so, yeah, so, so uh, avoid using this kind of thing for like things where one is strictly better than the other. Uh, it's generally used when uh, the, there's no clear answer about which one's best. So the password alternative is which one's best. It's probably, it should be clear to you that there isn't one that's best because they're all used, right? You have an Android, you're using a graphic password. You have an iPhone, you're using facial recognition or a, a, you know, a fingerprint. You have a laptop, you're using a fingerprint. You're using Facebook, you're using third-party sign-on. Uh, you're using Safari, you're using the password manager, right? Like there's, there's no reason why all 10 of those things would exist in the world if there weren't people that were using them, right? So. Uh, when you see a problem where there's lots of different alternatives, that's usually a sign that there isn't a great solution to the problem. And so an evaluation framework is meant to sort of showcase what the trade-offs are uh, between them, uh, between the different alternatives, okay? Then what you'll do is you'll come up with some properties. So you have like property one, property two, and I'll, I'll give you a concrete example in a second, but just so we know what, where we're going. Uh, and then for all of them, it's just sort of like, yeah, it has the property, right? It doesn't have the property, you know, maybe this one has this one and this one has this one. And then you can, uh, I'll talk in a second, but you might have like a half dot or something. And we, we'll talk about those symbols. Uh, uh, actually, let's talk about them right now. So uh, I'm going to call these tips, and by the word tips, I mean they're things that you might do, but they're not necessary, okay? So they're, they're good things that, you know, I've done these things in lots of papers. I've probably done 10 of them, uh, including like really big systems that we're comparing, and I've read lots of papers that use them as well. And so these are just things that seem to work well in practice. Doesn't mean you, you can't make this work if you don't follow my tips, okay? Uh, so they're just, they're things that, that uh, you can consider. So the first thing I like to do is I like to keep the symbols themselves very simple. So I like to have a simple uh, scale. So for the evaluation itself. And so some people might want, you might want to use numbers like, oh, this is level one, two, three, four, those kinds of things. I don't know, I just like the dots graphically. And uh, I find that if you have a simple scale of just a dot or not a dot, you can capture a lot about the system. And if you want to be more specific, you can be more specific, but then you really have to get into the nitty gritty details of all the systems themselves, okay? So this is meant to show a lot of high level properties, the kind of properties where you're not worried about exactly how it achieves the property. You're just worried about like, does it do something rather than nothing about this property, okay? So uh, because you're going to consider a wide breadth of properties, uh, you're not going to like weigh yourself down by, by giving really specific evaluations. Um, so I, I like a three point scale uh, where uh, basically you have like a full, it fully achieves the property, uh, it doesn't achieve the property, and then in the middle 
you can have like a kind of half uh, half dot. So this would be like it fully uh, achieves the property. Sorry, I'm just going to try and get rid of that hissing. Um, this is, uh, it does not achieve property. And this would be sort of in the middle, okay? And what I would suggest to you is that you, you don't have to have a half dot, okay? So only use it if you need it. So try and do it with just a full dot and, and no dot. And then if you're really worried because you're like, this system looks terrible because it's not getting any of the dots, but I know it's doing something about these properties, right? Like it, it doesn't work fully, but it, it's doing more than nothing and it should be getting something. Then you can start thinking about what a half dot means, okay? So uh, you use this as needed and I'll show you some examples where, where, we, might, uh, where we might use it. Okay, if you write up an evaluation framework, you're gonna have the chart, you're gonna show it. Uh, but I might look at your chart, and I might disagree with your rankings and your scores, right? Or especially if I'm a designer of the system, I look at how you rank my system and I feel like, oh, that's not really fair uh, to my system. That's fine, okay? Two different people will probably do a slightly different evaluation framework. It shouldn't look completely different, right? Uh, so the, the sort of best systems or the dots should be like roughly equivalent, uh, but, but there's, there is room for differences between you know, how you define the dots and which ones you include and things like that, okay? So this isn't an exact science where I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a method and all of you would do an assignment where you do evaluation framework and you would all come out with the exact same result. This isn't that kind of thing. It's more like a write-up or something like that where you're going to hit the same main points, but there's going to be some differences uh, in, how you, in how you evaluate things, okay? Um, but what's really important is you tell me why, okay? So when I read your evaluation framework, if I don't agree with it, I at least need to see why you gave me a dot and why you didn't and what it means to even get a dot and that type of thing, okay? So you just want to spell out exactly why uh, you did what, what everything is, okay? So uh, the, the columns we'll call criteria or sometimes I call them properties. And so we want to like define uh, the criteria or properties. Okay, so what, what does it mean? Like for passwords, it might be like, does the user have to remember anything, right? If you're using biometrics, you don't have to remember something. If you're using passwords for every site, you have a different password, you gotta remember a lot of stuff. If you're using a password manager, you have to remember the master password, but you don't have to remember every password for every website. Okay, so that's the kind of thing where you could see like, um, biometrics would be good because you don't have to remember anything. Uh, uh, password manager is kind of in the middle, that might be a half dot, because you do have to remember that one password. Or single sign-on, I'm logging in through Facebook. I have to remember my Facebook password, but I don't have to create a password for every site. And then a bad system would be one where I have to remember 100 passwords if I have 100 accounts on 100 different sites, okay? Um, so anyway, so, so you would define what that property means. And then you would very clearly say, what does it mean to get uh, a full dot, a half dot, and no dot? And you would do this for every property. So saying it fully achieves the property isn't enough because, I mean, that's a vague statement about properties in general, but what does it mean specifically for the number of passwords that you have to remember, right? So like, for example, what's a half password or a half dot uh, in that case? So a half dot, it's uh, how I define it, right? So I might define it as you have 100 accounts. If you have to remember zero passwords, you get a full dot. If you have to remember one password, you get a half dot. And if you have to remember more than one password, 
you get no dot. Okay, so that's a crisp definition. It's very specific. And then it's also easy, it's not controversial. When you look at Facebook Connect and you see that it got a half dot, you know exactly why it got a half dot, right? Because you have to remember one password or whatever. So it's, it's very clear. Um, so you want to define what each of these mean for each property. Okay, so, so if I have a different property, the number of passwords doesn't make sense. So I have to repeat this exercise for every property. So what, what each of them means. I keep alternating between criteria and properties. But. Okay, uh, the, the next thing is um, you want to change the phrasing of the property so that you always want it. Uh, so you phrase the cr uh, uh, criteria or property positively, or in other words, uh, such that you want the property. So for example, let's say uh, using that example, let's say you remember zero passwords. Okay, that's better than remembering one password or remembering 100 passwords, right? So that's something I want. But you could equally capture that idea by saying, uh, like you could have your column that's like, do you have to remember more than one password? So then a full dot would be like, if you, if you have to remember more than one password, you get a full dot. But this is a dot you don't want. You don't want that dot, okay? And then it gets confusing if you have, like some of the columns are dots that you want, and some of the dots are, or some of the columns are dots that you don't want. Then you look at a system and it has some dots and you have to figure out, okay, is this the good dot or is it a bad dot, right? So it's better to make them all good dots, okay? And then when you look at it, it's like the more dots you have, basically the better, uh, the, the better you're doing, okay? Um, so, so this is uh, good. And this kind of wording would be bad in this case. Okay, uh, so you'll recall from uh, last class we had a bunch of um, uh, passwords, alternatives. We brainstormed them. And uh, in this case, uh, another, I guess maybe another tip, I'll write it in as a tip, is um, don't evaluate brand names of things. So I'm not going to compare Facebook Connect to Google connect to Apple's one ID, open ID, or like all those different types of things. They all do basically the same thing, okay? So I'm not going to focus on like comparing different brands of the same technology. I'm going to focus on what's the umbrella technology. And then, you know, that Facebook would be an example of single sign-on, for example. So I, I would just call the thing single sign-on, okay? Um, so, so when you come up with the alternatives, you want to uh, compare like sort of umbrella or big like concepts of technologies rather than specific brands of technologies. Okay, so for passwords, uh, what we came up with is, first we have the baseline, so it's just like, you remember 100 passwords for 100 different sites. Uh, we talked about biometrics, and so I'm not going to, 
get into fingerprint versus iris versus whatever. I'm just facial recognition. I'm just going to lump it all together as biometrics. Now, there's no wrong way or right way. You might break it out and decide there's actually big differences between a fingerprint and an iris. And I want my evaluation framework to showcase that. That's fine. So you could do it that way if you wanted. For this case, we're going to look at broad technologies. And if I went through the exercise of uh, putting in a row for fingerprints and a row for iris, I would see that the dots are exactly the same. So that's another thing that, that you don't always get the evaluation framework right on the first pass, but you might like do it and then you might say, oh, these two rows are exactly the same thing. I wonder if they're basically the same technology, just different brand names. And then you might collapse them into a single representative row. Uh, so that I would argue that that's what would happen if, if you split biometrics into different uh, kinds of things. Uh, we'll do a hardware token. So this would be, for example, RSA. Um, so I explained this last time, but it's basically like a little thing that's on your keychain, has a random number on it. And when you log in, you log in with your username, you log in with your password, and then you have this random number as well. So it proves that you know the password, but it also proves that you have possession of this thing. So if I learn your password by shoulder surfing, I don't have your thing on the keychain. If I steal your keys, I have the thing on your keychain, but I don't know your password. Okay, if I do both, then I can be you, right? So it's, it's not perfect, but it's better than just a password, or it's better than just having something to log in and, and not having a password as well. Uh, I'll, I'll go through more of the specifics of how RSA works uh, in, a, in a bit, um, because it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. But. And we'll, we'll talk about an attack on RSA later in the course, so I'll, I'll explain some of the details here. But. Uh, uh, yeah, so I shouldn't write this. Let me uh, just put two-factor. So this is, would be like Google or something like that. Uh, and so this would be like an SMS message. We'll just assume that. There, there are slight differences in security between whether you have the Google Authenticator app on your phone or whether you're getting it over SMS. Mainly SMS, SMS is not encrypted and it's also easy to forge phone numbers. So I can like get, if I can get your phone number then I can get all your messages routed to me. Whereas if, it, if you have an app, I can't necessarily do that. Uh, password manager. So this could be something like LastPass. Could be something that's built into your browser, or it could be something that's built into your operating system. So there shouldn't make a big difference uh, between them. We will make one simplifying assumption, and you'll see in the paper about this that they they evaluate two password password. Sorry. They evaluate two password managers, and the only difference between them is whether they have a master password or not. Um, but yeah, now all password managers have a master password. Uh, so yeah, uh, we talked about client-side certificates. This is basically like you have some crypto key that's on your computer. Uh, cryptographic keys like a password, it's random, uh, but it's system chosen, it's not chosen by you, and it's a lot longer than a password, and it's probably too long to commit to memory for most people, and if you could commit it to memory, you could probably only remember one. You're not going to remember two, three, ten, or a hundred of them by, by memorizing them, okay? It'd be a big task just to, to memorize one uh, crypto key. So it's more like something you have that's a file on your computer as opposed to something you know like a password. Uh, we can have what I'm calling single sign-on. So this would be, for example, Facebook Connect. So this is, uh, instead of creating a new account for a website, you're just like, oh, I already have a Google account, I already have a Twitter account, and so I'm just going to log in using that credential and then it asks, the website will bounce the request over to Twitter, and Twitter will say, yeah, that's, that's actually the right thing, and then, and then you get access to it. 
And then uh, graphical passwords is the last one. So this is rather than remembering an alphanumeric uh, 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 string, uh, you're going to remember some picture or something that looks a certain way. Uh, so the, the most common one is, is the keystroke unlock on Android where you draw a pattern uh, through a lattice. Okay, any questions about these? Are, are you clear about more or less what they are? Is there any that you're not clear about how they work? Yeah. Sorry, for which which one? Seed. Seed? Uh, okay, uh, so that would be a client-side certificate, I guess. So it, it's it's a cryptographic key that you uh, you just have a, a more mnemonic way of remembering it kind of thing. Yeah. So instead of remembering uh, like characters, the characters are mapped to words, and then you memorize the words instead. Yeah. So it's kind of like a usability tweak, but it's basically client side certificate. And once again, like most people can't commit that to memory, and if you did, you could probably commit one to memory, but you're probably not going to remember ten of them. Okay. The last password will need to drop a message. Right. I think they are different in many ways. Okay, so uh, I haven't used Windows in a while, so I, I can I can talk about Apple's implementation of that. And so in Apple, you have two passwords that I believe can be different. So first off, you need access to the computer. So if I'm not logged in, so I need to know the login credential of the computer itself. Yeah, but then I need a second password to uh, to unlock the like you can set a different password on top of the keychain itself, but I believe. Yeah. Yeah. But you still have to log into Windows first. Yeah. Yeah. So the Windows password and the PIN are equivalent? Same. They're the same thing? Okay. Okay. So then that's fine. So it's it's still a password manager that has one master password. It's just a smaller master password. No, but I, I think it's not very complicated. I think it's my idea. Maybe PIN is not safe like Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so I, I don't disagree with that. So, so there could be tangible differences between these that would cause them uh, to, to get a different rating. And so your job would be to come up with the property that distinguishes the two, right? So drill down and say, okay, I, I feel like Chrome's insecure, but what is it? Like, you know, and maybe it comes down to like the entropy that's protecting the two accounts or something like, like one's a short four digit thing and the other is a big password or like you have to isolate what that difference is. Then you can make a property and then you can distinguish them. So they'll look the same. They'll have all the same dots except for on that one property and then they'll have different ones. Does that make sense? Okay, other comments, questions? Okay, uh, Okay. so now we have to come up with some properties, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna suggest that these are good uh, super categories of properties to think about. So, oops. All right, so evaluation criteria. So this is a security course. So obviously we're going to think about the differences in security uh, between them. Okay, but if you think about, um, I don't know, the difference between biometrics and putting a password in, there's security differences. So we, we captured those already. 
But another big difference is like uh, biometrics is just easier to use, right? So like assume that they were equivalent on security. They aren't, but let's just assume that secure from a security perspective, they're exactly the same, right? You might like a biometric better because you don't have to type anything in. It's quicker. Uh, you don't have to remember anything or something like that, okay? So we call that usability. So usability is basically like what's the burden on the user? Uh, and so there's going to be big usability differences uh, between these. So usability can include, um, yeah, how easy is it to use? What do you have to do if things go wrong? So sometimes systems are really good when everything works. Like a biometric is great until, I don't know, your finger gets cut off and you don't have your finger anymore, right? Then like what happens, right? And then it could be really bad, right? Like a password reset's easy, but like maybe this system is bad or something like that. Okay, so. Um, Anyway, so and usability can also, you can think about accessibility. I just lump it under usability, but that would be like persons with disabilities. Can they use the system? Uh, what kind of disabilities uh, map onto which kinds of systems uh, could you use? Okay, um, then another thing is like the more practical things like cost, right? Like if, if you're going to switch to a fingerprint based authentication, you have to get fingerprint readers. Right, so your phone has to have it, your computer has to have it, your door, office, store, or whatever has to have it, okay? So now you're going out and you're spending $100 per person in order to give them all a fingerprint reader, okay? So that's a practical consideration. Uh, same with like software, like do you have to change the software and how things work, right? Like if I'm designing a website, I can just like copy and paste Facebook's code and now I have single sign-on, right? So that's really easy, right? But if I wanna do a graphical password, then I have to like, code it up or something. Maybe there's libraries for it or things like that. Um, and if I want to do client-side certificates, I have to get all my users change, to change how their computer works in order to, to make use of these client-side certificates, right? So deployability could be like, how many computers in the world do you have to change in order to make your system work? Is it just like throwing up one database or do you have to change every server? Or do, worse yet, do you have to change everybody's device? Um, so, so yeah, there's considerations like that. So all those kinds of things we call deployability. And so together, I know it's out of order, uh, but sometimes I call it a UDS framework. So usability, deployability, security. Now, is there some considerations beyond security, usability, and deployability? Maybe. Right, like privacy arguably isn't security, but maybe it is security. So that's one that's sometimes split out. Sometimes you have a really specific thing, like I don't know, I'm working on finance, and so I have some financial properties or something like that. Uh, so, so, so there are reasons why you might venture outside of these three, but these three really do a good job of, of covering almost everything, and almost everything you would evaluate with this method will use those three, and then might use something else in addition to it. Okay. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to come up with the actual columns themselves. And uh, I'm going to leave myself two pages to do this. And then I'll, I'll have the big table, which maybe I'll draw out in the break so we don't have to sit and watch me draw it. And then uh, I'm just going to make a, a little scratch place where I can take some notes about stuff uh, as we go through this. So I, I'll, I'll flip around in the notes a bit. But. Okay, so let's look at, um, at these things. And can anyone tell me what's the difference between them? Like, what's, what's uh, one thing that where one is better than another in any dimension? Could be deployability, usability, security, whatever. Uh, accuracy, 
Uh, okay, so accuracy would be. Okay, good. Uh, so in this case, would you consider that a security deployability or usability property? Okay, so you have to pick one. <laughs> yeah, so I would consider that usability as well. So I'm not going to, I have sort of notes about which ones I'm going to cover. So I'm not going to cover that one, but I also would like to put it in the notes. So I'll, uh, I think it's a good one. Okay, so the main problem there, if you drill down, is it's really, um, you're going to get errors, right? Uh, so, so you're going to measure your fingerprint and it's going to lock you out because there's a mistake. And so that's kind of like the fundamental problem. And so you want a system that ideally has no errors, right? So you might define a property, because remember you want it to be positive, you want it to be something you want. So you could call it error-free uh, Accurate might be, it's just kind of vague, like what accurate means, but error free, I, I feel like captures it better. Um, or a softer way of saying it is you could say infrequent errors. Yeah, so that's a good one. I'll, I'm not going to evaluate it, but uh, we'll keep that as one. Anything else anyone can think of? Uh, sorry, usability, last password. Okay, so why is a password manager better than uh, than whatever you're comparing to a biometric? Okay, okay. So basically, okay, so this is a usability thing. And uh, it's basically like the number of passwords that you have to remember, right? Okay. And what's the problem with remembering a lot of passwords? I, it's obvious, uh, it's not something complicated, but just tell me, what's the problem with remembering lots of passwords? Okay, you could forget them. Um, uh, there's also the effort of typing a password in, like say it's a long password, uh, whereas if with a biometric you would just do it, or with a, a master password you type it in once at the start of your session, uh, and then you don't have to ever type it in again. So those are kind of like two different dimensions of the same thing. But you're concerned about the number, of the, memor the, the burden of memorizing passwords, right? Okay, uh, yeah, so we can call it a usability property and we might call it nothing to memorize. And uh, this one we will evaluate, but let's just brainstorm for now and then uh, we'll, we'll do it, yeah. Okay, so something about costs. So that's going to fall into what usability, security, or deployability? Deployability. All right. Uh, and what exactly do you want to say? So let's say you have uh, the biometric against Azure. So, so to deploy uh, the biometric, you have to buy the specific hardware, like uh, either for the fingerprint or for the facial recognition, you have to buy a specific uh, tool okay. for it. And that has a financial cost? Yeah. So you're worried about the financial cost yeah. of it. Okay. And then tell me, how would you state that property? Uh, what do you mean? Like, uh, what, what would you write down as the column for that, to capture that? Deployability. Yeah, yeah. So you put it under deployability, but what would you say? Like, like. Uh, okay, costly or not. So, so this is, uh, sorry, I'm digging for something. So let's say you write costly, right? Now, in this case, if you get a full dot, that means you are costly, which is a bad thing, right? So this is just, a, I just wanted to use that as an illustration where you have to play with the English language a bit because you want to phrase it positively. So what's the opposite of costly? Affordable, Affordable cheap, negligible cost. Yeah, okay, right. So I'll, I'll just write negligible cost because that's what I have in the notes from last year. But, but the, all those phrasings are fine. Okay, so that's something you want, and it's something that biometrics not going to have. Okay, good. Any others? RSA is more secure. RSA is more secure. Okay, and why? So we don't have any securities yet. So what's what's more secure about it? 
Okay, so first off, you, you're saying it's more secure, but implicitly you're comparing two things, right? You're not comparing it to the whole list. You're comparing it to just the password. Okay, so I have a plain password or I have a plain password plus I have some other factor. And how is that other factor adding security? Just, you're right. I just wanna, we have to drill down on exactly what that property is. So, so what is it that it's adding to uh, in terms of security? Okay, uh, so randomness is one thing. So it does add more randomness, uh, in particular because the user password is user chosen, right? And so users aren't good at choosing things with randomness. And uh, the token thing will give you a truly random number because there's a random number generator. Okay, so that, that's one aspect. There's actually a couple ways where it's more secure, uh, but let's put that one in for now. Um, okay, now why is randomness better? Than no, low, why is high randomness better than low randomness? Okay, so it makes guessing attacks harder. Okay, so we might say something. So if I want to write down a column, um, now once again, I might fall in the trap. I might say, oh, it's easy to guess. But that's a bad column because that's something you don't want, right? So I have to say the opposite. So what's the opposite of easy to guess? Hard to guess, difficult to guess, yeah. And so, uh, or if you want to be really fancy, you could say resilient uh, to guessing. Or to brute force, yeah. So uh, I'll define what guessing means, uh, and we'll look at brute force or exhaustive search as one technique that works uh, probably for all of them. So yeah, I would say that they're all, exhaustive search is probably the best uh, thing that you could do for, for, for all of them. Okay, anything else? Uh, I think biomasters yeah. are secure. Yeah. And I'm giving trust to another company. Okay. So like pass password manager, I give trust to yeah. third party something like this. Okay. Maybe hack them. Okay. So you're worried about the reliance on a third party. Exactly. Okay. So uh, in this case we could say there's no trusted third party. So that would be a security property, more like a, a um, privacy property that we could say here. So there's no trusted third party. Yeah, okay. And then uh, there's that you could maybe split into two. Uh, so there's the consi security consideration, which is uh, now this party knows all of my passwords, so they could break into all my accounts, right? So that's a security dimension. There's also a privacy dimension, which is every time I log into your site, because I'm logging in through Facebook, Facebook knows. So they know the time of day and where I am, what my IP address is, like whatever. They collect all this information and they're going to use it as well. Um, so there's, uh, so, so that one you could even break into further down into like the security consideration and then the uh, privacy consideration as well. Yeah. Okay, okay. So it could be the, um, uh, now would you actually implement it from scratch? Okay, so you need to, and so are some systems, is it easier to get a password like storage library than it is to get uh, iris scan biometric authentication storage? Probably, right? Yeah, so, and, and what's the difference there? Is it the complexity of the code? Is it how many people use it? Is it how long it's been around? So anyway, so yeah, so one thing we could do that I know is in the original paper is uh, they have a pro property they call maturity. So the, the basic idea is the, the longer it's been around, the kind of the better it is, right? Uh, so the more chance you have of being able to use a library. If it's something I invented last month, maybe there's one library that does it. If there's some problem with my library, maybe no one's found it. And everyone in the world's going to, that uses that authentication is using one library. Whereas if it's some commonly used like mechanism, people have been using it for 20 years. There's a library in every language, right? Like the, the attack surface goes down, like sort of the more mature it is. Yeah.
Okay, okay, so there's the cost aspect of it, but you're not talking about cost, you're talking about the complex, the code complexity, right? Okay, okay, so you could have something like that. So, the, um, so to put it positively, you'd want low complexity uh, implementation. Okay, good, other ideas? Okay, and why? I agree, but what? Okay. Okay, and, and why is that key more secure than a password? The one password that you need to know. Yeah, okay. Uh, is it fair to say it's more random? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and therefore it's harder to brute force or exhaustive search. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, so I agree with that, uh, but we have that property already. Uh, so resilient to guess. So sometimes you, you come up with the same property, and then when you evaluate, you realize, oh, these two properties actually end up being the same thing. So that would be an example of that. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, you could think of that as usability or deployability. Yeah. So it depends. So you could be focused on the cost of it. So then it would be captured on negligible cost. Yeah. Uh, the, the usability property would be like, why, why don't you want to have an additional? First off, would you rather have a device or not? Right, right. Okay, okay. So, so you would prefer something where, uh, so the property they call it is nothing to carry, uh, which I think captures it. So basically, you don't have to carry around something else. You don't have to have your phone with you or your laptop with you or something like that. And so you don't need any additional device. And there's accessibility reasons for uh, why you wouldn't want to carry something around. And then there's also inclusion uh, issues, but th that there may be captured by negligible costs as well so like even if i give you something that's free to carry around it's still worse in terms of usability to carry around even if you didn't pay for it because if you forget it or something another thing is what happens if you lose it yeah okay okay so we could talk about resilient to loss uh in this case you can think of it it could be a security thing like if you're worried about like if i steal your cryptographic key or your computer that has your key on it then I can log in as you, so that's a security consideration. Uh, if I seal your RSA token, I can't log in as you because I still don't know your password, but I've just locked you out of your account. And so now it's like, it's a pain because you have to go and get a new one and re-register and stuff like that. So uh, it could be a usability thing or a security thing depending on which way you look at it. So nothing to carry kind of captures the idea that, that if you carry it, it, you also could lose it and then you'd have to re-enroll. But from a security perspective, we could think about uh, resilient to theft or loss. But theft is, is the idea that someone's going to take it and they're going to try and use it, right? And so you ideally, for, from a security perspective, you don't want someone to be able to just steal it and then, and then use it. Yeah? OK, so it could be speed. So yeah, I would consider that a usability thing. Um, so efficient. Okay. Okay, great. I agree. So we, I think that's already captured in nothing to memory. I don't know why I phrase it that way. Nothing to memorize. Sorry, I can't even read my own handwriting. Uh, so in this case, it's, it's not nothing to memorize, right? So there's, you have to remember 100 passwords for 100 sites. That's bad. You have a fingerprint. That's good because you don't have to remember anything. But a graphical password could be where you might introduce a half dot. You might say, well, you do have to remember it, but it's easier to remember than a password.
kind of thing. So that would be an argument for a half dot. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. So in this case, you would probably break it down by the specific accessibility property that you want. Uh, so you could say that, um, like, basically it's compatible with a certain disability, right? So in this case, it works for visually impaired, right? Now, um, there are assistive technologies and things like that. So you can, if you're visually impaired, you can enter a password. You could even speak it. Uh, so I, I don't know that there is a difference there, but uh, there are certainly things that, that are a lot easier, like CAPTCHAs and things like that. I know that's not passwords, that's something different, uh, but, but you know, and the security can change too. So like they might have an audio CAPTCHA, but it's easier than the visual CAPTCHA and, and things like that. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so you can, a, a passphrase is, anyways, whatever, whatever. Let's just uh, try and write it. So how would you capture it as a column? So if you want to focus on visual impairment, uh, then you could say that it uh, just, I would just say it as plainly as possible, like does not require vision. And then you could repeat it for like, it doesn't require motor skills. It doesn't require like being able to hear or whatever. Um, yeah. And uh, if accessibility was your focus, you might do all the different uh, disabilities you can think of. And then you could have a full accessibility study of it. So these authors don't look at that in detail, but they, they have a few properties like uh, that that are sort of accessibility properties. Yeah. Uh, so biometrics again, because you don't need something, you have to do. So you don't need to something carry something. Yep. Yep. So that that would be under nothing to carry. Oh, okay. No worries. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so it's something you know and something you have, and so why is it better to have something you know and something that you have? Yeah. Right. So I agree a hundred percent with you, but we have to write down, like, how does it make it more secure? So it might be obvious, but like, how how would having something in addition to knowing First off, you could compare it to just having something, right? So if you compare it to just, if you have something on one hand or you have and know something, what's the difference in terms of security? So it would come down to theft. If I steal it and you just have it, then you're done. And if you have it and you know it, then you're still safe, right? So we got that one captured because we have uh, resilient to theft. Now let's think about the flip. So uh, you know something, right? or you know something and you have something, right? So how is that, how does having something more secure? So if I can break what you know and not break what you have, then in the system where you just know something, I get in, and in the system where you have something and you know something, I don't get in, right? Okay, so what does it mean to break something that you know? So it's a guess. Is it brute force exhaustive search guessing? So you could do that, but, but, uh, but okay, what I'm thinking of is like, say you pick your birthday as, as your password, right? I know your birthday, so I'm better able to guess your password. And in that case, if you have something in addition to your password, then it's going to protect you, right? It's going to give you that additional, right? Um, yeah, okay, so uh, we can call it, uh, we often call it impersonation uh, attacks. So I'll write that down. Uh, so resilient to impersonation. Impersonation. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, in this case, it would be how expensive it is to do the authentication protocol or something. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, how uh, much memory does it take and how much, let's say, if I have no computer, does it computer support this type of authentication uh, flow or whatever? 
Okay, okay. So there's two separate issues there. So one would be like backwards compatibility, yeah. right? So, so you could put that under deployability. So like uh, it's backwards compatible, meaning it works with old technology. And then the other is like uh, when you do run it, how fast or slow is it? Yeah, so, so you could have like low low runtime complexity, low overhead, whatever. Overhead's too vague because you want to be specific about what it is, but. Um, now, I would argue that all of these are, are so low that, that you don't care about. Like, all of them are capable of, you know, authenticating millions of users per second without, like, much overhead. But, yeah, if you're Google, you're thinking a lot because, like, think of how many people are logging into Google at a given time, right? It's not like Concordia's website where it's, you know, maybe one person every second or something like that. And so they, uh, uh, the complexity might make a big difference uh, in terms of things. Yeah. Okay, any other ideas? Okay, so energy. So that's sort of similar. Maybe I'll keep it under computational complexity. So mm -hmm. you, you worry about it either because it takes a lot of time or you have to pay a lot. And usually you can solve time complexity by throwing more energy at it in the sense of getting more servers and things like that. Yeah. And then cost is also sort of related to it. So negligible costs might actually end up being the same thing as this. So you, I was thinking of like the cost to give a fingerprint reader, but it could also be the cost of the server that has to authenticate. Uh, sorry, so say, so this, the comparison between this one? This, um, the one Oh, uh, yeah, okay, so, so one of them was like, uh, if you're a developer, how complicated is it to write the library? And the other one is, once the library is written, how, how expensive is it to run it? Does that make sense? Okay, so resilient to theft deals with the security concern, but you're concerned about the usability, like basically how can you recover? Yeah. So uh, so let me put like easy recovery to loss or something. Or like how easy is it to reset, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. This one here or? Uh, does not require vision, et cetera. Yeah, I need to slow down and write clear question and work on that. Okay, uh, let me uh, just take a look. Okay, so there was only one other one that I was going to cover. Um, so I'll, I'll pick a subset of these and, and I'll show you what the dots mean uh, for all of them. Uh, but th the other one was, uh, well, I'll just write it, it's security property. Uh, we call it resilient to observation. Uh, so if you're typing a password in, I can be behind your shoulder and I can see you type it in, okay? Uh, so that wouldn't be resilient to observation. Uh, if you have a crypto key on your computer, it just automatically goes across and there's nothing for me to see, All right? I just see that you said, yes, send the key and then that's it. I don't see the key. It's not shown on the screen or anything like that. Uh, if you have a fingerprint, we can argue about whether it's resilient to observation, like I could lift your fingerprint. Uh, so I would argue that it's not, but it's not like you're showing your fingerprint to everyone at the same time. So that one's maybe in the middle. Um, so, so that might be one. Uh, another one that they do in the paper that's a slight variant is they talk about resilience to internal observation and external. So external would be like someone's looking over your shoulder. And then internal would be like you have malware on your computer and can the malware on your computer capture the password? Uh, or if you go to a phishing site, can the phishing site capture uh, your authentication information and like what how much observation would you have to have in order to basically uh, capture um, it uh, phishing itself actually maybe slightly different so you could talk about resilience to phishing um, uh, so to give you an, so a phishing uh, website would be like like Google with three O's right so you go to Google with three O's the website looks exactly like Google 
and you're tricked and you're about to put your username and password in. If you're just using passwords, then you've given your password to the phishing site. If you use a password manager, your password manager saved your Google password under the URL Google. So it's not going to cough up your password to Google with three O's. It's going to, the computer's going to know that it's different. So it won't cough it up. And because you didn't memorize the password, that's why you're using a password manager, then you couldn't even type it in anyways. Maybe you could go look it up and, but anyways, you could do like a lot of work to like try and get tricked. Uh, but, but it would be a first line of defense against phishing attacks. Um, so so that, that could be another uh, property. So resilient to observation would be like keystroke loggers. So like at Concordia, uh, a few years ago, someone put keystroke loggers on a bunch of computers in the library. And a keystroke logger is like, in this case, just a little USB thing. So this has a whole complicated setup, but normally like the keyboard would just plug into the monitor, plug into the computer. So all you do is you have a little dongle and you plug the dongle into the keyboard and then plug the keyboard into the dongle. Looks almost the same. And it just, you know, will capture every keystroke and then it could maybe have a Wi-Fi connection and, and uh, put it on a server where someone could fetch it, or maybe you have to physically come back and take the dongle uh, to get the password, so depending on, on how complicated it is. But that's the kind of thing. So, so you could think about, like if you do a graphical password, then in this case, it wouldn't get captured. But that's also because it's specific, like you could have a screen reader or something like that that would capture it. But anyways, uh, different ones, uh, different types of authentication might be, there might be differences in, in how vulnerable they are to these kinds of attacks. I also I'll put resilient to phishing as well as one. Okay, so this is a good set of columns. So now what I'll do is I'm gonna pick a couple of them and we're gonna look at what does it mean to get a full dot, half dot, empty dot, and then we'll actually do the exercise of, of trying to, to figure it out for uh, the eight uh, authentication types that we have. And then as we're doing the dots, I'll, I'll also uh, take some notes. And then I'll show you what like, it looks like if you put it in a, a true academic paper. Um, yeah, so anyways, that's an ambitious agenda, but uh, let's take a break uh, maybe for, for, well, let's go until five after seven or so. Yeah, whatever, uh, about a 10 minute break. Uh, and then uh, uh, and then we'll do all that stuff. And in the meantime, I'll, I'll just draw ahead so that uh, we can move a little faster through this. All right, everyone, we'll uh, start again. Okay, uh, there was one question during the break that actually is probably useful for all of you to know. Uh, so the question was, uh, if you're using Google Scholar and you find a great paper, it might be from IEEE or ACM or something like that, and it's behind a paywall. Uh, what do you do? How do you get access to it? Um, so it's true, most academic paper journals you have to pay for, but Concordia as a university subscribes to all of the major ones. So the easiest thing you can do is be on campus. So if you're on campus and you use uh, Wi-Fi or a, a network connection, if you have one, then it will just automatically go around the paywall. If you're at home and you wanna have access to it, uh, you can log in using uh, the library. So you would search for the journal name in the library, you would find it, uh, and then you would say, give me access, and then it will redirect you uh, to, to the journal article itself. And if you're technically sophisticated, uh, and that sounds like not so fun, uh, what you can do is you can get something called Easy Proxy, or sorry, the technology is called Easy Proxy. So all it does actually is it, it uh, puts Easy Proxy as a sub, domain and then redirects uh, here. I'll just show you an example. It's easier to explain. But. So I'm going to have access to uh, the paper uh, because I'm already on the, the campus library, but uh, I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. So so this is a paper. Uh, Let's see if I can. Okay, so here you can see that I can get the PDF right away. 
But if I was at home, I think this article might happen to be open access anyways. But, but anyways, if I was at home, I wouldn't necessarily have that. And if I clicked on it, it would bug me about logging in and, and that kind of thing, right? Um, so uh, what I would do is I would say, okay, this is published in communications of the ACM. Actually, sorry, this, this version is published in ACMQ. So I would go to the library website, search for ACMQ, and then I would get access to it this way. Uh, if you want to set it up, you can get extensions for all the major things called EZ proxy. So EZ proxy. And uh, so you can see what it does is uh, the, the original URL is dl.acm.org. And basically all it does is redirect you to dl-acm-org and then .lib-eproxy.concordia.ca. And if I'm logged into the library, if I'm not logged into the library, it will then ask me to log in. Log in with the same username password as my Concordia, uh, and then you'll have access to it. So you can manually overwrite these emails, or you can just install an easy proxy thing, and it will say, okay, what's the address of your easy proxy server? And so in, in the information you would put in is uh, lib-easyproxy.concordia.ca. And then, uh, yeah, and then if you're on a website, you just click it, and then it will ask you to log in, and then, and then you should get access to it. If it's a really obscure journal that you might not have access to it, that's usually a sign that it's not a good quality paper. Uh, so all the major, like, good quality venues Concordia has a subscription for, it's very unusual. Uh, it might be a really old paper, or it's from some weird venue that, that you probably don't want access to anyways. Okay, uh, so, so yeah, that, that could be useful to you. And if you don't follow that whole easy proxy thing, you can just go to li li Concordia Library page and then search for the name of, of the journal or, or uh, publication that you're, you're trying to look for. Okay, uh, let's go back to this. Okay, so what I'll do is uh, I have some notes. It's just gonna be easier to follow the example that we did uh, in last class as opposed to making it up. I'll get all the dots in the right place. Um, so I'm going to pull some of the, the properties that we talked about and I'll show you, let's like, we'll do a dot by dot analysis. So our job is basically to say, what does it mean to get a full dot, half dot, no dot? And then to actually say for each alternative, whether it gets a full dot, half dot, or no dot, okay? Uh, so the first one we'll do is the physically effortless. So just for convenience, I'm gonna call it U1 so my chart doesn't have big long uh, names. Uh, so I'll call this physically Okay, and uh, I'm just sort of cheating by looking ahead, but I'm going to introduce a half dot. So like I said, if you can get away with no dot or just a full dot, that's best. Uh, but in this case, I think that, that a half dot is, is actually a reasonable thing to have. And I think we actually talked about this. So. The worst thing is if you have to put a password in every time you log in, okay? Uh, so you're typing it or you're drawing it. Next best is you just have to do it once. You do have to do it once, but uh, it's only once. Um, so type draw once. And then uh, if you never type or draw, that's best. Okay, uh, and so then we can use this criteria and hopefully it's, it's pretty clear what each of them get. So I made this little chart. So we're talking about U1 here. Um, okay, so for passwords, what do I do? Do I have to type, just for normal passwords, how many times do I have to type a password in for every site I go to? So every site, I have to type every one in. So what does that mean in terms of this property? Do I get full dot, half dot, or no dot? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Uh, what about biometrics? How many times do I have to type a password in? Zero. None. Zero. No. So zero times, right? So is that good or bad for this property? Best or half good? Best. Okay. So we'll give a full dot. Uh, let's say that I have some token. So this is like the RSA kind of token. Remember, I still have a password. Okay, so I have to, first off, I, it's actually worse because now I have to type my password in plus I have to copy this number on my thing. So no dot. 
Uh, two factor. Same thing. Uh, so we get no dot because I have to still type my password in, plus I might have to type in another number, or at least copy and paste it from my text message. Uh, what about a password manager? Okay, why half dot? Okay, so I type it once, but then if I visit 100 sites, I just had to type it that one time. So that's better than typing in every time. So I'm getting some property, but it's not as good as typing it never, which would be like biometrics. Uh, so I can give that a half dot. Uh, certificates, full, because I don't have to type anything. It just automatically happens. Uh, single sign-on, half, because I have to put in my Facebook password, but then I don't have to authenticate to each individual. Uh, graphical passwords, nothing. nothing. I still have to do it for every site. The only difference is I'm drawing uh, instead of, uh, instead of uh, typing. Okay, uh, this one's very closely related, uh, but it's basically like, Nothing to memorize. All right, so uh, here we could have zero things to memorize. Here we could have one. Uh, I'll just call it a password, but it could be anything like a string or, or whatever. We'll just call it, consider them passwords. And then here it would be like two plus passwords. Or maybe alternatively, you could define it as like, if you have X uh, websites, it would be like S, S, X West, sorry, X passwords for X accounts. So 100 passwords for 100 accounts, 10 passwords for 10 accounts. Basically, the number of passwords is growing linearly with the number of accounts you have. Uh, so you could imagine like there's one that, like a master password that where you have two passwords, but it's always two, even if you have 1,000. So in that case, that looks more like a half dot than, a, a, than even though technically, uh, because it's two plus passwords, it, it would give it no dot. So, you, you can play around with how you define them and different people in the class will define them slightly different, but, but it's basically going to look kind of the same. Okay, so this actually ends up, I think, looking exactly the same as, as the previous column. Uh, here you have X pass, 100 passwords for 100 accounts. Biometrics, you have no passwords for 100 accounts. Tokens, you have to type in 100 passwords plus 100 strings for 100 accounts. Two-factor, you're going to type in 100 passwords plus 100 SMS random numbers for 100 accounts. Password manager, you're going to type in one password for 100 accounts. Certificates, you're going to type in nothing. Single sign-on, you're going to type in once. Yes, yeah, sorry, so but what's your point? For a manager, you have to type in one password for 100 accounts. Uh, so a password manager, uh, you unlock your password manager, and then it fills in the passwords for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so when I go to Concordia, it auto puts in my name and password, and then I go somewhere else, and it auto fills it. Yeah? Yeah, OK. That is just so everyone's clear, like what it looks like. Um, so I, I use a password manager, like just Apple's. One. So let's say I go to my Concordia. So I'm here, right? And uh, I have already saved my password for this website. So I don't know what it is. I don't remember. It was chosen when I enrolled. Apple chose it for me. It's some big, long, complicated thing. There is a way that I can see it. Uh, but I would have to type in a pass my master password. And so in this case, I can plop it in uh, using my master password. But Apple, uh, once you unlock your computer, they have biometrics. So this particular laptop has biometrics. So for me, it's uh, if I want to use this account, I just use my fingerprint. Uh, and, and then uh, it, you can see it auto supplies the password and, and logs me in. So that's what a password manager is. So clear, we're all clear on why it's a half dot. Uh, single sign-on similarly is a half dot. You still have to log into Facebook or whatever, but then once you're logged in, then you can you don't have to log into individual accounts. And with a graphical password, you're going to have to swipe it on every single thing that you want to unlock. Is there any way that you can only have one password? 
Uh, so what I'm envisioning is imagine if every website used a graphical password you would still want like your Twitter graphical password to be different than your Facebook, to be different than your Instagram, different from Snapchat. Yeah, so you should still have, because if I can break one of them, then I could break all of them. So the advice, we, it's, it's a weird to think about because no one uses graphical passwords except for Android. So everyone just, ought, just has one graphical password, but the, the concept is still that you would have a different graphical password for every site. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Let's do another one. So I'm doing all the usability ones first. Uh, so nothing to carry. So full dot would be I don't have to carry anything new, like or I don't have to carry anything. Uh, nothing would be like there's something new like here's this RSA token now you have to carry it around with you everywhere you might lose it you might forget it and then you can't log in too bad and then you can think about whether you need a half dot or not so like one half dot that people have advocated is like what if you're carrying something that you're already carrying around with you anyways like your phone right so like that doesn't seem, I mean, you still have to carry it. So it's worse than not having to carry it, but it's different than an RSA token where it's like you have to go out of your way to carry this thing around, right? So you, you could maybe have a half dot for like your, you have to carry something, but it's a common, right? So you're carrying. But then it's up to you to find what does common mean and like it could create more problems for you than, than it's worth. But, but anyways, we could try that. Okay, so with passwords, do I have to carry anything? Sorry? Full dot, yeah, yeah, full dot. So no, I don't have to carry anything, therefore I get a full dot. Uh, fingerprints, iris, do I have to carry anything? Not anything that I'm not already carrying with me. Uh, what about a token? So that's something new to carry, or is it something common? It's new, right? Most people don't, are walking around with RSA tokens, so we'll give it no dot. Uh, Two-factor authentication. All right, so we could argue it's your phone. You're probably carrying it with you anyway, uh, so we'll give it a half dot. Password manager, nothing. Uh, certificates. Okay, so certificates, I'll argue... Like uh, it's a file that's on your computer, so you have to have your computer. So that is something you're carrying, but you're kind of carrying it around anyways. Yeah, so that kind of feels like a half dot to me. Uh, single sign-on, full dot. There's nothing to carry. Graphical password, nothing to carry. Okay. All right. So uh, let's talk about security. So I pulled out a couple examples. All right, so we're going to talk about resilient to guessing. Uh, resilient to guessing, I'm actually going to break into two uh, kind of properties. Um, uh, okay, so let's say, uh, let's actually, let me take some notes on this and then uh, we'll, we'll come back and to define the property itself. Um, Okay, so let's say I'm a website, whatever, Concordia, you wanna collect usernames, passwords, things like that. Uh, first off, how does it actually work? Uh, so the way it works is sort of like this. So first you have a registration process. So here's Alice. Here's the website. And 
And uh, when you register, you've authenticated her, you've checked her email, whatever, you're now ready. You're like, give me your password. Uh, so Alice will send her password across. And you're the website, so you're going to store it, OK? Uh, and so uh, let me put the username going across as well. It's just that would be a little easier. UN just means username and password. Maybe I'll abbreviate user. It's maybe a little more clear. Okay, the password needs, or sorry, the website needs to store uh, this password, okay? There's basically three ways of doing it, of uh, sort of increasing betterness. Um, the first thing they could do is just have a big table, and they're like, okay, here's everyone, here's all the usernames, and here's all the passwords. And then uh, what the user will do is they'll come back later and they'll say, so this is like registration. And then later they're, they're going to try to authenticate. And so I'm just going to say password. Uh, I'm going to put it like a little tilde here to indicate that maybe this password is the same, maybe it's different. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go look up the user and I'll see, oh, they're here. And then I want to know whether P is the same as the password they supplied. And if it is, they get in. And if it's not the same, then I don't let them in. Okay, now what what's, could go wrong if you just do this? Okay, so we could think about a brute force attack. So uh, how easy is this password to guess? Uh, so that, that's one thing. Is there anything else? Sniffing. Sorry? Sniffing. Sniffing. So I could try and sniff it off the wire. I'm going to assume that these are over a secure channel. Okay, so this is over what's called SSL, and you're going to know all about SSL in, in three weeks, I promise. Like more than you ever wanted to know. But, uh, so we'll assume that those, that in transit, it's fine, it's encrypted. Okay, so there could be some client-side vulnerability, keystroke logger, or something that captures the password client-side. There could be a server-side vulnerability uh, that's sniffing the passwords as they go by after they're decrypted. Uh, what's another server-side vulnerability? Let's say I breach the server. What do I learn? I learn everyone's username and password, okay, for the whole site, okay? Um, so in the case of a breach, I don't even have to do an exhaustive search. Okay, I can just, if I can breach it, uh, then I get everyone's username and password. Okay, so this is uh, insecure. If breached. Okay, is there anything I can do uh, that's a little bit better? Let me just clean up this writing so that okay does anyone know anything uh, you okay okay so you have to know a little bit about crypto but not that much uh, but uh, anyways what you could do instead is you could put the password through a one-way function so one-way function mathematically will like turn it into a random looking number and there's no way to go back okay um, so instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to store the username and a hash of the password. If you don't know what a hash is, look it up. Like, I'm going to assume that you don't have to know all the details of a hash function, but you should just know at a high level what it is and how they work. Okay, why is this better? Okay, I'm, a sir I'm an attacker. I breach it. Now I have what? Okay, so I have everyone's username and I have the hashes of their passwords. There's no way to go from the hash of the password back. 
Okay, okay. So that's an important consideration. So it is true that I can't look at the hash and figure out what the password was that went in. Another thing too is actually when Alice comes back to authenticate, if these are all like hash, then how do I tell whether it's the right password or not? Okay, exactly. So if I find Alice is this entry, then what I'll do is I'll take her password that she supplied, then I'll hash it, and then I'm going to compare it to the hash that's sitting there. So that I just want to make it clear that that, that doesn't stop you from uh, verifying it, okay? Um, so, so you can check uh, whether uh, that, that equals H of P. Okay, so I can't reverse it, but if I have a guess at what the password is, can I tell whether it's right or wrong? Like say I think your password is ABC, can I look at a hash of your password and figure out whether your password is ABC? Okay, so I can't look at the output and reverse it, but I could take ABC, I could hash it, and then I could see whether it matches, okay? So I can still attack, um, okay, so basically the properties here are, is that you can't reverse a hash, but what you can do is you can, if you have a guess, you can do, you can check whether the hash of your guess is equal to the hash of P. And if this is correct, then this equality holds. Okay, so if you guess right. So you can still do a guessing attack, but you have to try every password. Okay, um, so that's fine. Uh, we'll come back in a second to, 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 to like what exactly that means. Um, now, another thing is, let's say that everyone hashes, there's basically a couple hash functions and if you are a modern person, you're probably using a hash function called SHA-3, okay? Uh, so I get all these hashes of passwords and I get it from your site, uh, so I breach your site. But there's someone else and they have a website and they also use hash, hashes using SHA-3. They hash all their passwords, okay? So if I have a guess, what I can do is I can run it through all the passwords in my list. So I think your password is ABC, so I, I don't, I, first off, I can check not just you as a user, I can check every user in the website. Then if I find other password breaches from other servers that are using the same technique, then I can check all of them at the same time as well, okay? So if my goal is just to get a single account across lots of different web servers, then I just need one user somewhere across that whole thing in order to, uh, to find one account that I can log into. Um, so what will happen is, uh, what people will do is they'll, they'll have a dictionary of guesses. So attackers will do this. So they'll say, here's like 10 billion uh, guesses of passwords. Uh, maybe they're uh, like common words, maybe they put two common words together. Maybe it's based on past leaks and looking and seeing what people do. Uh, maybe they substitute like the number three for the letter E. So they try every variation of a word with like simple substitutions. Whatever they think a human would do, uh, then they're going to uh, make a variant in their dictionary. Uh, and then what they'll do is they'll hash every single one of them. And they'll sort the hashes. So now if I breach uh, a password and I'm looking in here, what I'll do is I'll look up the hash of this password in this list, and I just have to search because it's already in order, and then if it's in the list, then I can just recover it right away. So I don't even have to do anything expensive. I don't have to hash it a million times with my million guesses, someone else did it for me. Um, so it's still expensive uh, to do, but it's basically a one-time cost. Like one person does it once for one hash function, as opposed to everyone doing it themselves. Um, so this is called a rainbow table. Okay, and so the best thing that you can do that's even better uh, than storing a username and a password is you have your usernames and for every user, you choose a random number, okay? And it, you choose a different random number, and you write it down. So it's in the, the database. If someone breaches it, they learn what the random number is. It's fine. 
Um, and then what you do is you hash the password with the random number. Nonces. Yep, so these uh, things are sometimes called nonces, sometimes they're called salt. Okay, now I can't build a rainbow table. Uh, if I build a rainbow table, I have to first pick what this random number is. So if I build a, ra uh, a rainbow table, I'm checking, I'm running my dictionary basically through hash of the word from my dictionary with this particular random number. And when I build that dictionary for that particular random number, it's not going to work for the other random numbers, okay? Because they're, they're going to have a completely different value. So, or if you have two people have the same passwords, these two values will be completely different because the random number is different. Yeah. Blockchain? Uh, no, no, not related. Yeah. Um, uh, not exactly, no. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is just called salted passwords. And then another thing is with, when I build a rainbow table, I do at least once have to go through and hash every common guess. So if I can slow you down, like if I can make that hash function take a second instead of taking a hundredth of a milli, or like a hundred milliseconds, or not even, like, like uh, one millisecond, uh, then I can make it harder for you to construct a rainbow table or, or make it harder for you to, to try and brute force a guess as well. Um, so another thing that people will do is they'll hash it like a thousand times. So instead of just hashing it once, you hash it a thousand times. Uh, so this is called like a slow hash. And there's, there's more sensible ways of doing it. Um, Okay, so now it's really hard. Like, I can't use any rainbow table. Like, if I want to attack this user, they're the only user across all the different websites that have this particular randomness. So I have to start from scratch. I have to personally try and brute force this password from scratch. And now this hash function is slow, and so I can only do a couple guesses a second, for example, or maybe one guess per second. But if I have parallel machines, then I could, I could do more things. But I'm going to have to put a lot more resources into it. Okay? Does it stop an exhaustive search? No, but it makes it harder. Okay? Now, what's the point of all of this? The point of all of this is that exhaustive searching isn't, uh, it's more like a spectrum. It's not like it's easy or hard. It's not full dot, half dot. It's more like, well, it could be a full dot if the password is big and random and then people are salting it and they're using a slow hash function. But if they're not doing that, then it's, it's a half, like an empty dot or things like that, okay? So a lot of times in these, these evaluation frameworks, they are kind of forcing you to kind of draw a line in the sand and say, okay, this is what a full dot means, right? But really you have this like kind of whole spectrum of different options, okay? So that's why we split resilient to guessing up into two categories. Still not going to give us the full spectrum, but it's going to give us a little bit more, uh, more verbosity in terms of, of how, we, uh, how we rank it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a simple binary, either full dot or not. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that you're able to get, for example, this, okay? So let's assume that, that, that you attack the, s the server and you're able to recover the password list, but it's hash, salted, slow hash, like whatever the most secure option is, okay? So we'll use that as a starting point. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that you have access. Uh, actually, uh, I'm not going to, I will assume that in a second. Okay, let's say I go to Facebook and I want to guess your password. Okay, there's two ways of doing it. One is that I break into Facebook and I get their list of passwords. Okay, is that the only, do I have to have this list of passwords in order to have a couple guesses at your password? What else could I do? Okay, and, and what do I do in terms of this diagram? So I submit the password to the website, right? So there's two ways of guessing. One is I'm guessing by just spamming the website with my guesses of the password. And the other is that I capture it like written down and then I'm able to try and uh, brute force it uh, basically with a file as opposed to using an online interface, okay? Now, why is the difference significant? 
Okay, so you don't need to breach, so it's going to be harder uh, because I have to breach Facebook in order to get this file. So anybody can do this, right? Uh, which one's faster, do you think? If I, let's say I give you, I say, okay, you can either, you have a thousand guesses at my password, you can either just send them to Facebook and Facebook will tell you uh, yes or no, or I'll give you this file of, of the passwords that are hashed and you can try your, your thousand against it. Which would you prefer? Why would you prefer the second one? Because it truly depends on the, the hardware you have. Okay, so it's going to be faster because I can do it on my own hardware. Okay, the other one I'm limited to the online interface. What else will happen if I go to Facebook and I try and log in for the 15th time with the wrong password? They're going to lock out the account and then I'm not going to be able to guess again. Okay, so I would much prefer to have some, even if it's a cryptographic like representation of your password, I much prefer to guess against that than try to guess through an online interface. Does that make sense? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll split it into, is it resilient to guessing uh, in terms of uh, what we'll call online guessing? So online is like you're putting the passwords into Facebook. And then here uh, for S2, we'll consider offline, meaning I can throw my own hardware at it. I'm not limited. Now there's a different way of thinking about passwords, uh, which is how random are the passwords, okay? And so randomness of passwords is just sort of an aside. And so I'm not going to go into a big lecture about this, but there's this way of measuring randomness of things. You have to know a lot in order to compute it, but intuitively it's pretty easy. It's called entropy, so entropy is the measurement of, uh, of randomness. And basically what it does is it takes something that's random and it says, how many times would you have to flip a coin to, to get that equivalent amount of randomness? Okay, so if you flip a coin once, it's either heads or tails. So we call that one bit of randomness. It's either a zero or a one, a heads or a tail. Uh, if I flip a coin twice, then I have four options, right? So it's one of four things. So that's better, that's more random because there's four options instead of one option, or sorry, instead of two options. If I flip three coins, that's better because now there's eight options, okay? So entropy is basically a measure in bits or number of coin flips of how random something is. Fair coin flips, okay? So, so entropy basically converts basically uh, how many fair coin flips. Is it? And so when you look at a human password, it's hard to put a number on. Like is that 10 bits or is it 12 bits? Like you'd have to make some assumptions about the English language, for example, if it's, it's not necessarily even chosen in English, uh, but Anyways, you have to make some underlying uh, assumptions about languages and things like that. So you might not get a good number, uh, but you could also look empirically at words that people have chosen in the past and then try and get a statistical distribution. If you do a crypto key, a crypto key is going to be 128 bits of pure randomness. So like the computer is going to literally like flip a coin. If you use a password manager, same thing. It's going to like flip, do the virtual or the, the digital equivalent of flipping a coin and then it's going to give you something that has a certain amount of entropy. Okay, so just as a very rough level, uh, if you want to be vulnerable uh, to, or if you want to resist um, online guessing, you need to have about 64 bits or 64 coin flips, okay? If you have less than that, then even if I have to go through an interface, there's still a good chance that I can not necessarily break your password, but if I just care about getting one account, I can... I can try you, your username, someone else's username, and eventually I'll, I'll get it. And I, I can probably do that in an online guessing world, okay? Now, if I go offline, I can blow through 64 guesses, or 64 bits. Uh, uh, so that would be two to the 64 guesses. You don't have to follow the math. But the point is, in an offline world, 64, that's no problem, okay? It's not like I could do it on my MacBook Air in five seconds, but I could do it on my MacBook Air in a couple days. Or if I have some servers and, and computers, I could do it in 30 seconds or something like that. Yeah, or on the cloud or something, if you're willing to pay. Um, 
OK, so 64 bits isn't enough. So if you want to resist offline, uh, then you need a bigger number. So NIST has a number that they say is sufficient, which would be 112 bits. So anything less than 112 bits is kind of not resistant to offline guessing. OK, so blah, 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 whatever. Um, now the question is, OK, what about things like a human password or a fingerprint or you know, like where do they fall in this sort of dimension? Like, are they, are they less than 64 bits? Are they between 64 and 128? Or are they more than 128? Okay. And so roughly, I can say that it kind of looks like this. So let's say we have zero bits. We have kind of like 64 bits. Say we have 112 bits here. OK, so any kind of like password is going to be probably less than 64 bits. It, you know, humans, when they choose passwords, it's not everyone, right? You could choose one that's more than 64 bits. But if you take the average human choosing the average password, especially when they're trying to memorize it and they're memorizing it amongst 100 other websites, uh, then you're looking at something that's probably less than 64 bits. In other words, passwords aren't great at resisting exhaustive search attacks even if you have to submit them online and you don't get an offline. If you get them offline, then, then you're really, yeah, you're really in trouble, okay? Biometrics are kind of in the middle. So if I have to, like, imagine Facebook used fingerprints. I don't know what that means. You have a fingerprint reader or something like that, but let's say that somehow it did it. Uh, I wouldn't be able to spam it fast enough, the server, and be able to guess your fingerprint. But if I got a hash of your fingerprint, then I could try all the different variants of a fingerprint, and I could, I could, I could in that case, uh, exhaustively search and find your fingerprint or, or an average kind of fingerprint. Okay, and then a cryptographic key would be an example of something that's secure. So it's secure against offline or online attacks. Okay, so that's kind of roughly uh, what what it looks like. So if we go to our chart, uh, so passwords basically aren't going to get anything. Uh, biometrics will resist. Yeah, exactly. So it'll be full empty. Uh, if we think of tokens, they're adding a random number. I'm going to assume that the random number that they add on to the end is, is you get the entropy from that. So that's enough to bump it up to like 112 bits. So once again, this is an assumption I'm making, but I'm going to give it full. And same with two-factor authentication, because I don't just have a password anymore. I have a password plus I have uh, your other uh, factor. Password manager is tricky. It, so it depends if I'm attacking the site or if I'm attacking the password manager itself. So if I attack the site, it's definitely full full, because the password manager will choose a random password, and it's a big, long thing. But if I'm attacking your password manager, your password manager has a master password. And if I can get your master password, then I can get your password for all the websites. And so all your master passwords are kind of under the umbrella of this. Sorry, all your website passwords are under the umbrella of one master password that's still chosen uh, by a human. So I would leave it blank blank. I, in the past, I've given it full full. It depends on how you define the thing itself. But for me today, I'm feeling like blank blank is, is, is the better option. Uh, certificates, you're going to get full, full. Okay, so that's like a crypto key. Uh, single sign-on is like a password manager, so you still have a master password. And a graphical password, I didn't put on the chart, uh, but it turns out that graphical passwords aren't really uh, higher entropy. They're sometimes easy to memorize at the same level of, of entropy, but I would put a graphical password here. Definitely a swipe pattern on an Android. Doesn't, it doesn't have that much entropy. And I'm not saying that you, that, um, um, so let me uh, put an important qualification on these two things. There's a difference between a password that's chosen for you. So let's say your password is only six characters, but the computer chose it and it's a random six characters, special characters, numbers, capitals, and things like that. That could actually be a pretty solid password. Okay, that, that could easily get over 64 bits, maybe up to 112 bits. But if it's human chosen, that's different. 
So you could count up the number of swipe patterns on Android and say that's a huge number. Uh, there's, there's 64 or 112 bits when you measure out a, a random swipe pattern. But do humans actually choose a random swipe pattern? No, they don't, right? Uh, and so the star here would be like human chosen. Okay, so that's the sort of, sort of important caveat here. Okay, how bad are humans at choosing passwords? Uh, I'm glad you asked. And uh, I'm going to show you. Okay, uh, I'm going to actually show you in a picture uh, form, so just give me a second to find the picture. Okay, so the picture I'm going to show you comes out of an academic paper uh, there should be a link to it on the course website if you if you want to take a look at the paper. You can see lots of math, like this H of stuff is like entropy, like H1. So there's lots of complicated math trying to calculate distributions and entropy and things like that. And then they have this really nice chart that to you looks like a bunch of noise at the moment. But uh, this actually turns out for me uh, to be my favorite chart in all of computer science, which is saying a lot. And I promise you, you'll like this chart uh, once I take five minutes to explain it to you. Okay, so this is a, a kind of weird uh, looking chart. Let me get it all on the same screen at the same time. Actually, this is probably good enough. Okay, so the story of this chart uh, behind it is there was a, a website, it was called uh, RockU. It was like before Facebook, like around the time of MySpace, if no one in the room remembers that. Uh, but anyways, it was like an old social network like kind of website. It was geared towards music fans. Uh, that's why it was called Rock You, whatever. Uh, their password uh, database got leaked. And if I recall correctly, it was the bad form where it was just the passwords in raw. Maybe it wasn't, maybe they were hashed, but anyways, it was pretty simple uh, in order to, to, to recover it. The other thing about Rock You is that they didn't have any, a strict password policy. So you could use any password you wanted. And this was like a long time ago when people weren't as worried about like password breaches. It wasn't all over the news and things like that. Um, so lots of people, I forget what the number was, but um, lots of people uh, when they uh, chose their password for the website, they just chose a simple four digit pin, kind of like a bank code, okay? Um, and so what the researchers did is they were able to get this information. And so they saw all the four digit pins that everyone ever chose. And they were interested in uh, how random are these four digits? So are they like, like, does it just look statistically random or are there certain patterns? Like do humans tend to choose certain four digit pins more than other four digit pins? So what they did is they built what's called a heat map. So what you see on the screen is actually every four digit pin. Uh, so let's say that we want to, uh, let me get a different color. So let's say we want to look up a pin like one, two, three, four. So this is how you would read the chart. So you can see that it's like kind of chunky and there's little squares. All those little squares represent a specific pin. So if I want to look up one, two, three, four, I would look up the first two digits. So you can see there's a column here for 10, there's a column here for 11, and then there's a column here for 12. So I'm going to look in this vertical column here, okay? And then three, four would be right before 35 here. Okay, so every person who chose 1, 2, 3, 4 is represented by this square right here. Notice that this square is 
darker than all of the rest. What does that mean? In a heat map, that means more people chose it. OK? So what this chart shows us visually is that lots of people, and this is actually a logarithmic scale, uh, so what, if that means something to you. Um, but basically, like way, 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 way more people are choosing 1, 2, 3, 4 than they are choosing 1, 2, 3, 5, or I don't know, 6, 5, 3, 9, or something like that. OK? Uh, so this little black dot uh, means that, uh, yeah, lots of people chose it. Now, let's say that systems, like a computer was choosing these, these digits at random, like your bank assigns you a random password and uh, no one ever changes their, their code, okay? What we would expect to see is a blue diagram that's just blue, like all the same color of blue, like one of the middle shades of blue, okay? We wouldn't see like darker spots here and lighter spots here and those types of things. It would just be a very uniform looking blue, okay? But here you see that there's lots of structure to it. Right? You see that there's lots of like weird little shapes and, and, and things like that. Okay? So let's, let's take a look at some of these. So first off, like look at right here. Uh, you see that it looks kind of like a castle maybe, like a moat uh, in terms of uh, shapes. Uh, if you're very observant, you might look and notice that it's, uh, you see a very similar kind of shape here, although it's flipped on the side. Anyone want to hazard a guess at what this is? Okay, let's think about the numbers itself. So uh, if you look really closely, you see it doesn't actually start at 0, 0. It starts at 0, 1. Um, so let's just take 0, 1 as an example. So the first two digits are 0, 1. And you can see that this whole column is pretty uniform. There, there seems to be a slightly darker dot here. But they go all the way up to 31. OK, so 0, 1, uh, 0, 1, basically up to 0, 1, 31. OK, if we go to 0, 2, it stops at 28. Then it goes back to 31. Then it's 30, 31, 30, 31, 31, 30, 31, 30, 31. Does that sound familiar? OK, dates, right? How many months does January have? January is 0, 1, and it goes up to 31. How many dates does February have? <laughs> Careful. <laughs> okay, so 28, 29. Okay, so there, there are a few people that are choosing a leap year. Uh, March has 31. Okay, uh, April has 30. And so what this represents, actually, this dark shape here is all the different dates, right? So dates are a very common thing that people would, would choose. And so what's cool about this diagram is, let's say, aliens came to Earth, and all they knew was what passwords humans chose as four digits pins, right? They didn't know anything else about human culture. They could actually read out the Georgian calendar from this diagram just looking at passwords. They could figure out, you know, how many dates our month system has and, and things like that. All right, so this is month, month, day, day. Uh, this one's one, two, three, four. Uh, this one is day, day, month, month. All right, so, so humans like those kinds of passwords. What about this, like, there's this streak. See, it gets really dark, and then it kind of continues along here. What do you think that is? All right, so this is a streak that's, like, it starts at 19XX, where XXX is kind of like around 1940, 1960. It gets darker. More people are choosing 1990, then 2001, 2002, and then around 2010, it kind of dies out. 2010 is when this password database got leaked. Um, so yeah, so this is going to be year, 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 year. So for example, this might be like 1990, and this might be 2007 or something. Okay, what else do people see? All right, so there's this diagonal. Uh, so let's just look at one of these dots. Um, so this happens at 4444. Okay, this one, if you look at it, happens at 6969. I have no idea what that means. Um, Anyway, so these, uh, this whole diagonal is 
uh, numbers of the form like ABAB. So they're just nice numeric numbers. People like them. They're easy to remember. And then if it's all the same digit, you'll see that every now and then there's a little dark square uh, where it's a little darker for 4444 or, or that type of thing. Um, so anyways, it turns out that you can, um, you can spend a lot of time looking at this chart and uh, you can uh, figure out, like basically you just pick a random dot and then you look it up and there's usually some reason uh, behind it. So this is like four, two, three, one. Um, there's one up here. I think I might have this. I think someone corrected this in the notes. I have to remember. But uh, this one's five, six, nine, one. Uh, does anyone know what that means? Yeah, exactly. And what, is, what does that mean? You're old enough to, to know what that means. <laughs> Everyone knows that, right? Five six nine one means love. How do you? How do? What is? What's a Christmas? Okay, okay. You might have looked at the notes ahead or something. That's why I've written down. I, someone else, I think, corrected it. But it, it, love is somewhere in this. I think it's at that number. But anyways, uh, back in the day, uh, you would have a cell phone and it didn't have a full keyboard, right? And so if you wanted to text someone, you would. If you want to text them an A, you would press one. And if you want to text them a B, you would press one twice and then three times for C, and then et cetera, et cetera. And so anyway, a bunch of these are like kind of like the numbers that you would press to spell out different words back in, back when you didn't have a full keyboard. Um, so yeah, there's that one. Uh, there's like an Usher album. Remember, this is like a music site. Uh, so 8710 is an album by Usher. Oops. Uh, what else? Anyways, that's that's some of them. But I promise you, yeah, if you spend a lot of time like circling each dot, you notice like there's a streak here, and there's like a streak here, and there's almost always some reason uh, behind it uh, that you can do. So this is something you can stare at uh, for for a little bit of time and and find fun things. Okay. Um, anyway, so so to answer the question, uh, very bad. So there's a big difference between a random password and a human chosen. If it's, uh, so to put this back in security terms, let's say that I, uh, this actually happened. So in California, there was someone, I forget the details, there was some sort of terrorist related attack and someone bombed somewhere and they left behind an iPhone and the iPhone was locked, okay? And so the FBI wanted to unlock the phone to see if there's any data on it. And I forget if it was locked exactly by a four-digit pin, but let's just say for, for the sake of, of um, uh, the example it is. Now, the problem with the iPhone is it had 10 guesses and then it would like wipe, or that was a setting that you could have. So the person had enabled that setting. So if you were to guess, you only had 10 guesses at a phone. Are you going to guess, you know, 1111, 1112, or? Maybe let me put it differently, like 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0002, up to 0010, and then that's it? No, you're not. You're going to guess 1, 2, 3, 4, and then you're going to try 8, 8, 8, 8, right? So there's, there's patterns, and you're going to do a lot better at guessing uh, using this. So in terms of exhaustive search, most people don't start with, like, your password is AAAA, and then AAAB, and then AAAC. What they do is they build dictionaries. They pick common words, common patterns. They look at, they apply machine learning to like past leaks to try and figure out what people are doing. Like they take the website name and then they add their username or whatever. Whatever it is, like that's how you guess about passwords. And so the raw entropy is, is an upper bound of how much password it ha or how much randomness it has. So if you're like, well, it's 12 characters and it's either capital letters or lowercase letters and numbers. So I can figure out how much entropy it is. No, that number's wrong because humans aren't choosing those at random. They're choosing something that's based on, you know, something, right, that, that you can use. Um, so, so uh, yeah, so guessability attacks are, are based on, on human nature as well. Okay, so, so anyways, that, that just goes back to the online, offline guessing. You're not going to do like a pure exhaustive search brute force. You're going to apply some human psychology. You're going to use dictionaries. You're going to use uh, past leaks and things like that to in, inform your attack. All right, let's uh, try a few more. Um, 
All right, there's three more, and then we'll call quits. Okay, S3, I penciled in as resilient to observation. And what I mean by this is it's just a fancy way of saying shoulder surfing. Okay, so basically if you have to type something or draw something that like is visible on the screen or I can see you doing the keyboard or whatever, then I'm gonna say you don't get a dot. And if you don't have to type anything, it just happens, then I'm going to say that it um, gets a full dot, okay? All right, so passwords, I have to type something. I could shoulder surf that, so I'm not going to give it a dot. Biometrics, you can argue, like, could I take a picture of your fingerprint? So, like, you could argue about what observation means, but the way I defined it was just typing or drawing something. So you don't have to type or draw something for biometrics. So under my definition, it gets a full dot, but you might define it slightly different so that it captures the idea of biometrics. And you have to be careful too, like there's high resolution cameras. And so like facial recognition, like, like you know like there's high, uh, like you can take a picture of someone, right? Now, facial recognition usually has some liveness check so it's like you can't have a static image of someone, but you could 3D print like some sort of mask or something like that. And you can lift fingerprints, you can 3D print uh, fingerprints. If you wanna, just for your own interest, if you think of physical keys, uh, if you can take a picture of a key, you can reconstruct it. So if I leave my keys lying, my car keys lying here, uh, you just take a picture of it and then you can go home and you can like figure out what the, the pattern is. Um, car keys are kind of a bad example because they're now like more like a remote key as opposed to a physical key, but, but anyways. Um, tokens, you've got to type in your password, then you're going to type in the, the code. Uh, so someone's going to look over your shoulder, they can do it. Now they only have a certain time frame, right? So when they're looking over your shoulder, they see what your code is, but next time you log in, it's going to be a different code. Okay, so it is a little better in that physical observation. So maybe we would introduce a half dot, but for now, just to keep it simple, I haven't introduced that. Uh, two factor, I'm still going to type something in. Uh, password manager, I'm going to type in my master password. But then once I type my master password in, then, then it will fill in passwords automatically. That happens for like, so, so like 100 sites, it's like it's physically observable once, and then 100 times it's not physically observable. So that, that actually might be a good kind of half dot. Uh, so let me go back and, and fix this. Um, so we'll call that, if you don't have to enter anything, and then here we can say, uh, if you enter it once, uh, we'll, we'll give you Uh, then we'll, we'll give you a half dot. So something like a, a password manager uh, could get a half dot. Single sign-on would, would similarly get it. Uh, certificates, it just happens automatically. Uh, and graphical passwords, I can watch you uh, swipe them in. Okay, uh, resilient to physical theft. If I steal something and I can log in, then it's not resilient. If I can steal everything you have, like physical things that you have, and I still can't log in, then I'm going to consider it secure, okay? So, uh, stealing something is sufficient to log in. and sealing something is not sufficient to log in. Okay, so with your passwords, uh, if I steal something, there's nothing to steal. I mean, I'm not talking about like stealing something out of your brain. I'm talking about stealing something physically. So there's nothing physically that I can steal that's gonna help me. Uh, biometrics, I could steal your fingerprint. That's physical. 
Uh, so I, that would be something I could steal. And if I have your fingerprint, then I can log in as you. Uh, tokens, I can steal your token, okay? But is that sufficient to log in? It's not, right? Because I still need your password in addition to it. So that's a tricky one, uh, but, but it still gets the full dot. Uh, same with two-factor authentication. Uh, I, if I steal your phone, I get one of your factors, but you still have the second factor that I don't know. Uh, password manager, same thing. There's nothing to steal. Certificates, it's a file on the computer. I steal your computer, I have your certificate. So I'm not going to give the dot there. Single sign-in, I, I can't steal anything. And graphical, same thing. There are things that are in your brain uh, that I can't steal. Okay, and then deployability, I'll just consider one negligible cost. Sorry, I really need to work on typing or writing more legibly. All right, so we could say it works with existing equipment. So for example, if we're thinking about the web, passwords for the web, I'm assuming you have a computer, you have a web browser, like all that stuff. Otherwise, you wouldn't be trying to log in, okay? Um, if you need to go and buy new equipment, then you're, you're going to fail along this dimension. And then we could have a half dot for kind of like um, you uh, you have to buy new equipment, but it's maybe equipment that you already have. Uh, another way of splitting it uh, that I did last time is, do you have to buy new equipment for every user? So like every single user needs it, or do you just need new equipment for like uh, one time? Like you need to go buy one server, and once you buy that server, uh, then, then that's fine for 100 users or 1,000 users kind of thing. So is it a marginal increase or a, a, a fixed uh, cost? So anyway, there's different ways of doing it, but I'll just follow what I did last year and, and we'll split it up this way. Okay, for passwords, do I have to buy new equipment? No. Biometrics, do I have to buy new equipment? And do I have to buy new equipment for every user or do I have to buy... Okay, so it depends, I guess, on the scenario. Like if it's physical access, maybe I have one on the lock and everyone can use the same one. If it's like on the web, that's kind of the motivating example, then every user would have to have one. So I'll give it no dot uh, for it. Note that these dots might differ a little from last year's notes because this is the fun of making it up on the fly. Uh, what about tokens? Tokens, yes, what? Okay, so yes, you do have to buy something. It is per user and no, then you get no dot uh, as a result. Um, what about two-factor authentication? Okay, so, so uh, you do need a phone and every user needs a phone. So if you define it that way, then we'll give it a zero. If you thought of it as like a common object versus a not common object, then it could get a half dot. But the way we defined it, I'm gonna leave it as, as no dot. Uh, password manager, do you need anything physical? Okay. A certificate. So you need your computer, but I said you already are assuming that you have the computer, so we'll, we'll give it the full dot. Uh, single sign-on, you don't need anything. Now, you could argue from the server side, you do. You need to throw up a server that's going to take all these authentication things, but you only have to do that once. So, so maybe that could be a half dot. So... In, in these cases, we might have to like, these are kind of vague. You might have to say a little more specifically uh, what they mean, but just for fun to get a half dot up on the screen, I'll, I'll put that as a half dot. And then graphical. So you need a way to enter it, but like you could use a mouse or a keyboard or something like that. Like you don't have to have a touch screen uh, per se. Uh, and so whatever, we'll, we'll give it the full dot. Okay. All right, so, so anyways, this is what an evaluation framework looks like. I'm going to give you one homework assignment, uh, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, your homework assignment is just to spend five minutes looking at a paper that's linked to, hopefully, from the course website.
Uh, so there's a paper here called The Quest to Replace Passwords. And this paper did exactly what we just did in class, except for it's like a 20 page paper, or actually more like a 40 page paper. And uh, they did a much more thorough job than we did. And I'll, t I'll highlight it next class. I, I don't have time now, but take a look. Don't read the paper, but just take a look for a chart like this. And so you can see uh, that this is basically what we did on a larger scale. So you have a bunch of different rows, our different systems, the same kinds of systems that we have. And then you can see that they have, uh, they came up with eight usability criteria, six deployability, and 10-ish security uh, criteria. And so you could take a look at them and just look at the columns and uh, we'll talk a little bit more in class. But this is the kind of thing that you would see actually in, in practice. Okay, any final questions? I'll see you all next week. Tomorrow there'll be office hours. The Zoom link I'll put on the website. I haven't done that yet, but uh, they're just drop in, so just join Zoom and I'll deal with you one at a time.